During World War II, there was a concern that Germany were going to invade the United Kingdom, therefore the US, needed an aircraft that could fly from the US over to Europe, drop the bombs, and then return on the same tank of fuel. It was going to be a proper intercontinental bomber, and that aircraft behind me is the B-36 Peacemaker, and in this video I'm going to take you on a detailed tour of it. Important requirements for this aircraft was a long range, so it had to carry a lot of fuel, and high altitude flying, which is why it had uniquely massive wings, and interesting engine placement, which we'll look at shortly. It's not on this aircraft, but directly in front were two 20mm nose cannons. This wasn't in the original design, in fact there was also no bubble canopy, as you can see with the prototype XB-36, and it wasn't until the cannon was installed that they had to raise the whole cockpit, as you can see with this one. Here's a photo of a production B-36 with the cannons installed. This here is the forward escape hatch for the forward crew members, although you'd need to feather engine number 3 as to avoid potentially hitting the spinning propeller. On the ground, they would access the cabin via stairs in the forward wheel well. This blister back here was the port sighting station, and while not fitted to this aircraft, two remotely controlled retractable 20mm cannon turrets would fold up out of here, and this is what they look like. This is obviously the forward landing gear, and behind that is the radar antenna housing, used for both navigation and radar guided bombing. Now let's look at the four bomb bays, which are absolutely massive. Now check out my B-17 and B-29 videos for what at that time were large bomb bays. And with the power of editing trickery, I'm going to jump to Dayton, Ohio, and include footage of their B-36 with the bomb bay doors open. And speaking about the bomb bay, they tested the idea of actually storing a parasite fighter aircraft in there, and its role would be to protect the B-36 from enemy interceptors. And here is that aircraft, the McDonald XF-85 Goblin, on display in Dayton, although its performance was inferior to any interceptor, and the docking process was difficult and dangerous, so they cancelled the whole program. Immediately on the left is the pressurised crew tunnel, which was so long that they had a trolley installed and pulled themselves along a rope. The yellow cylinders are all crew oxygen for potentially very long flights. The B-36 was also used for research into nuclear aircraft propulsion. In fact, a heavily modified NB-36H was built and carried a single megawatt 16 ton nuclear reactor in the bomb bay and an 11 ton crew compartment protected by rubber and lead was installed up front. Moving forward is the extra fuel tank in the middle. The nuclear reactor was not used to propel the aircraft, and the research was mostly looking at potential harm to the crew and environment from the radiation. But Air Force priorities were elsewhere and the program was cancelled. And then we eventually reach another bomb cradle. The bomb base could carry up to 86,000 pounds or 39 tonnes, which is incredible when the dry weight of a B-17 Flying Fortress was only 36,000 pounds or 16 tonnes. And here's the bombs that it could carry. This one is the Mark 17, which was the first operational USAF thermonuclear weapon, or a H-bomb, with a H referring to hydrogen. It weighed 41,400 pounds, and pilots actually reported the plane suddenly rising several hundred feet immediately after the bomb was released, due to the reduced weight. In 1957, one of these was accidentally dropped over New Mexico, but thankfully the plutonium pits were not installed, therefore it did not initiate a thermonuclear reaction. As you can see, these were absolutely massive, so this little fella over here is a Mark IV bomb designed to be a much smaller and lighter nuclear weapon. It weighed only 3,000 pounds and was retired in 1963. Now we'll move on to the landing gear, which is absolutely massive. Here's one of the two main landing gears, which are set up in a tricycle layout, and unlike many other aircraft of its era, it folds up into the wing rather than the engine cowling, and that's because the wing is just so big. Interestingly, the prototype actually came with these huge single wheels, which I've tried to film including myself to give you some proportions. They were almost 3 meters tall and weighed 600 kilograms each. Now I have no idea what I was thinking at the time, nor why I had these facial expressions, but here's a direct comparison between these tyres and the production four-wheeled setup, which spread the weight over a larger area. They're the biggest tyre ever fitted to an aircraft, but because they put so much pressure into a small contact point with a tarmac, this aircraft was limited to only three airports in the world, otherwise it would destroy the runways. In fact, they actually considered a tracked gear to spread the load, but this idea was later canned. Moving on, we'll check out the wing and engines. The wing itself is massive, in fact, 
crew members could walk inside of it right out to the turbojets at the end during the flight. This was designed before in-flight refueling, so the wing had to be able to store a huge amount of fuel. An absolute priority with this aircraft was high altitude efficiency, therefore having the engines behind the wing avoided having the prop turbulence interfering with the airflow over the wing. The leading edge was also very thick as you can see, so forward facing props would actually be pushing directly back into the thick leading edge, thus reducing efficiency. And because of the swept wing design, the propellers would also become dangerously close to the wing tip itself, and while it wouldn't touch, again it would just disturb the airflow. So all of these problems were resolved by installing the prop engines in a pusher configuration. You can see these little squares in the props and these were there to catch some of the warmed exhaust air from the engines and these kept the propellers warm and helped avoid icing. Remember that this could climb up to 50,000 feet and unlike other high altitude aircraft like the SR-71, there was certainly no aerodynamic heating, therefore the cold temperature was a major problem. But having the 28 cylinder Pratt & Whitney R4360 radial engines backwards did lead to other problems. The engine was designed to sit in front of the wing with the carburetor being kept warm by the air rushing past the engine and heating up. But when it was sitting in the opposite direction, the carburetor was now at the front of the engine so the intake air was cold and humid. Ice would eventually build up and obstruct the air intake which would gradually increase the richness of the air fuel mixture until the unburned fuel would make its way through to the exhaust and catch fire. With the B36D model, two General Electric J4719 turbojets engines were added to each end of both wings, and they were retrofitted to older models. So it ended up having 10 engines leading to the slogan 6 turning and 4 burning. Although due to those engine fires, engineers would joke that the slogan became 2 turning, 2 burning, two smoking, two choking, and two more unaccounted for. These significantly improved takeoff performance as well as the quick dash over to the target, but otherwise they were shut down during cruising to save fuel. These louvers here closed the airflow off at the front as to reduce the drag when they weren't being used. In total, all 10 engines could provide up to 40,000 horsepower for brief periods of time. Here's a cutaway example of this engine in Dayton. You can see the inlet, and then all these blades compressing the air, followed by a chamber where the fuel is added and then ignited and expelled out the back of the engine via a spinning turbine. This really is a simple design in contrast to the 28 cylinder engines that had many more moving parts which could possibly go wrong and often did. And here we are at the very wingtip. With a wingspan of 70 meters, which was 230 feet, it's wider than a Boeing 747-8 or a C5 Galaxy. The B36 was nicknamed the Peacemaker, which came from a company-wide naming competition. The idea being that it made peace by being a deterrent to enemy military aggression. But there were objections from religious groups who felt that they owned that term, so officially it just became the B-36. On top and around this position were two more retractable remote control 20mm cannons. This circular hatch is the ventral entry hatch for the rear pressurized compartment, and this here would have been the transparent bubble used as a sighting station. In fact, here's footage from Dayton of what they would look like. Let's check out this tail and what's interesting is that they initially considered a twin tail design, similar to the B24, as that design had a number of advantages. Remember that this was designed in the 1940s when buildings just weren't as massive as they are now. So by using a twin and even triple tail, you could design the same lateral control surface, but without creating such a tall tail. But in the end, they went with a single large tail and saved 1.7 tons, but needed extra large hangers. Right here at the back are more cannons which were remotely controlled. Above that is the ray dome, and inside those were two radars that could detect enemy aircraft and guide the firing. Now everything in this aircraft is massive. In fact, the control surfaces, such as the rudder and elevators, etc., had the same combined surface area as the B-24 Liberator's entire wings, but they did not have hydraulic support to move them. In fact, they worked by the pilot only moving smaller servo tabs, which were like trim tabs, in the opposite direction, and then the air would move the whole control surface in the direction that they wanted. It's really quite an ingenious design as it avoided the need for heavy hydraulic systems. In front of you now would be the aft crew compartment, which includes bunk beds, a galley, and access to the tail turret, but it was connected to the forward compartment by the tunnel you saw from inside the bombays. 
and if it didn't have nukes or goblins in the bomb bay, it also carried ECM equipment, which stands for Electronic Countermeasures. These are probably some of the best defenses these bombers had, and some of the equipment remains classified to this day, but essentially it's designed to confuse enemy radars and missiles. It can detect enemy radar waves and return a flood of waves to overwhelm their receivers, or it can actually even send back incorrect information so the aircraft appears many miles away from where it actually is. It had a crew of 15 consisting of a pilot, co-pilot, two navigators, a bombardier, flight engineer, radio operator, radar operator, two ECM operators, and five gunners. This specific aircraft was a B-36J and built as a featherweight, as the role was now primarily reconnaissance. Cameras were installed in the bomb bay and in other locations, and these flew over Soviet territory, taking photos. To improve performance, all of the guns were removed except for the tail. The blisters were replaced with flat windows, and crew numbers were reduced. The reduced weight allowed a service ceiling of 47,000 feet, although there were many reports of these going well above 50,000 feet. A total of 384 peacemakers were built between 1946 and 1954, but in the end they simply couldn't compete with the faster and also capable of in-flight refueling jet-powered B-52 and B-47 that you see here and that will be in another video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and comment below with your thoughts on the B-36 and please check out my channel for many more similar videos. Thanks for watching.